Good afternoon. We are on Friday, the 22nd of July, 2022, the feast day of St. Mary Magdalene. I've already recorded today's Mass readings, which is her feast day, and I'm now going to share with you the, um, this is the Mass as celebrated by Bishop Fulton Sheen in 1958 <coughs> excuse me sorry <coughs> and um, I stopped at page 50 well not 50 in the book but 50 in my folder which I typed it up so I'm beginning 1v which is 4 uh, the mark of the beginning of the mass the sign of the cross is explaining the mass as uh, 1962 uh, it changed after Vatican II but this is how it was prior to Vatican II I'll just say one or two small prayers and they will be short in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Amen O Angel of God my guardian dear to whom God's love commits me here ever this day be at my side to light to guard to rule and guide and a prayer to saint michael the archangel defend us in the day of battle be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil may god rebuke him we humbly pray and do you o prince of the heavenly host by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the other evil spirits who prowl through the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Lord, save me, or I perish. Keep me close to you by your grace, or I shall sin and fall away from you. Jesus, help me. Mary, help me. My holy angel, watch over me. Amen. Chapter 1v 4 The mark of the beginning, the sign of the cross. The celebrant to the right top side of the altar and from the book which he finds there, he reads... A short prayer. This is the introit or entrance, versicle, the ingressor or going in verse, as it is called in the Ambrosian liturgy. Its meaning becomes clear only in the light of an understanding of the old ceremonial. In the early days of the Roman Church, the Pope went from the Lateran Palace in a solemn cortege of his attendant clergy, deacons and acolytes to the particular sanctuary in which Mass was that day to be said. This rite existed in the 5th century under St. Celestine V and it was later embellished and amplified by Saint Gregory the Great. In it lies the origin of the processional entrance. Psalms were chanted by alternating choirs in antiphonal style, as it is called psalms, which were specially chosen for their consonants with underlying intention of the particular day's sacrifice. Thus they were joyous in Advent, but mournful in Lent, and on saints' days, as today is, they hymned their glorious triumph, and when the Epiphany and the Transfiguration were being commemorated, their theme was the royalty of Christ. Thus the introit became an entrance song or introduction 
in a twofold sense. In our time, there is but a vestige of this impressive rite in the use of a single anthem, followed by a psalm verse, or on occasion of a passage from some other book of scripture with Gloria Patri and the repetition of the anthem. Nevertheless, even this foreshortened elliptical introit keeps its function differing as it does from day to day and serving always as a sort of spiritual introduction which, by a few brief words, states the theme or point of emphasis of the mass formulary which it opens like today is Saint Mary Magdalene, her feast day, because she is the almost perfect Christian, notwithstanding Mary was the, because she was born without sin, whereas Jesus cast out uh, demons from Mary Magdalene, for which she loved him and served him well and she is our perfect Christian person who had good reason to love him so much and she was the first who saw him after he rose from the dead. As he says the words of the introit, the celebrant makes that holy sign which is above all others the mark of the beginning. In it and by it are all things done and brought to fulfilment. It is the emblem which sums up the fullness of all things known and concealed, the sacred sign of the cross. Five. <coughs> the mercy and the glory of God, the Kyrie and the Gloria. There are two notions which, like musical themes in a symphony, recur again and again in the Mass. We here find them brought together in two prayers which are complementary each to the other, the Kyrie and the Gloria to give glory to God and to beg his mercy are the two purposes which link man to God. It is because we know that God is almighty that we beseech him to have mercy upon us and are not all the varying nuances of these inseparable purposes expressed in that beautiful gesture by which the priest first extends and elevates and then rejoins his hands. It is a gesture which sums up all our yearning for divine things, the while by increasing our fervency it bespeaks our hope of salvation. The Kiri is a remnant of those litania dialogues, of those acclamatory prayers, which rose up spontaneously in the breast of the primitive church. It originated in the Greek-speaking East, perhaps in Jerusalem, where the Spanish pilgrim Etheria heard it sung about the year 500 and it is in Greek that we still say it. After the opening of the ceremony by the introit with its three verses from the Holy Writ, this simple plea carries to the three divine persons. In turn, our heartfelt need and purposive desire for salvation. Then, at once, 
there is intoned a hymn to the majesty of God, the Gloria. It is a very old prayer, already in existence in the second century, which was incorporated into the Roman Mass in the sixth century. It opens appropriately with the words in which the angel, angels sang praise to God in the highest. For it's not every Mass, a renewal in some sense of Christmas. And does it not mark once more the coming of our Lord? Beginning with this gospel verse, the ages of faith launch into a hymn of praise which in its free-flowing fulsomeness is like a torrent of love unleashed. Yet even this emphasis on the Father's glory cannot conceal from man his own wretched state. For this reason, when address is made to Christ, our mediator, the hymn re-echoes the appeal for mercy voiced by the Kiri. It is because he is holy, because he is Lord, because he is holy, because he is Lord. Because he is the most high God, that Jesus brings us salvation. And it is in suggesting the shining reflection of the bright glory of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, which is itself the pledge of salvation in a believer's soul. This most beautiful of hymns is brought to its end in sublime simplicity. V1 on page 48, which is 6, made one in the Lord, the collect. It is not enough to have adored and to have asked for mercy. A sense of unity is part of every Mass. Dominus Vobiscum cries out the priest. The Lord be with you. As with extended arms, he turns to face the people. And it would appear that the liturgy seeks, by means of this action, by the employment of this old salutation, borrowed from biblical usage, to satisfy a wish that all the faithful may be gathered together and made one in their supplication. This action is repeated at eight solemn times during the Mass. It is just such a gathering together of suppliants as it bespeaks that inspires the prayers called collects, which now follow. They are grave as Latin inscriptions in their terms and seem as if incised upon medals this is one of the chief moments of prayer at Mass. The other times being signalised 
by the secret and the post-communion prayers. These prayers are addressed to the Trinity in unity and while the people kneel. The priest, with hands extended, reads them from the book. Should he have to pronounce the name of Jesus, he bows his head to the altar cross. Is it because these prayers sum up and gather together all the intentions of the day's sacrifice that they are called collects? Historically, that title recalls the old custom of urban Rome where about the fourth century it was the practice for the whole Christian community to come together in one church that they might proceed with solemnity to the sanctuary chosen for the celebration of the day's mass. In this sense, the collect is the prayer of the plebs collector, the prayer of the assembled people. Were those Christians of the Middle Ages then so much at fault when they pushed this term further and explained the word as meaning the common prayer? As he recites these prayers, is not the priest gathering together as if in one sheaf? All our hopes and all our good purposes as if to offer them to God? And once more, is not the kiss with which the celebrant again salutes the altar? Before saying these prayers, is not the kiss a sign of the entire uniting of the assembly in Christ? That's the end of that section and now this is the mass from page 19 to page 26 preface as celebrated of course by Bishop Fulton J. Sheen 1958 as described by Henri Daniel Rops and we've now reached the preface. Every day Wherever the cross has been set up, mass is said. In villages and in teeming cities, there is the mass. In the far north or in some tropical hut, there is the mass as well. In the early hours of the morn, in some lonely church dotted here and there with a few worshippers, Mass is said by a priest who seems to be functioning for the sake of a mere handful of devout and with high pomp amid a vast multitude gathered in the brilliantly lighted Basilica of St. Peter. Mass is said after the Vicar of Christ has been born on the Sedia Gestatoria before the altar to the sound of joyous acclamation. Times unnumbered and at every moment of the day, mass is said in one or another place throughout the world. His Holiness Pius the Twelfth in his encyclical Mediator Dei calls the mass the chief act of divine worship, the apex and the core of the Christian religion. Yet, what does this act mean to us who assist at the culmination of the worship man wishes to offer to God? To us, who through it come face to face 
with the essence and the core of our faith to us who attend Mass. And what does it make of us? A young man of our day, who was seeking for something which he might believe, cried out, These people come down from Golgotha, and then they talk about the weather. It is so great act of immolation that we have been called to the commemoration of an act of sacrifice, which is all the more unexampled in that the victim is at once willing to suffer and nevertheless wholly innocent of wrongdoing. We are here confronted with the unfathomed mystery of the ransoming blood of that spotless victim of sin, in whose weakness, weakness is perfect strength, and in whose life death dies. Were it not that thoughtlessness and heedless familiarity lie over our souls like a hard crust, we could not bear to come to Mass as though it were but some conventionalism of social ceremony, for we would realise that it should mean everything to us, and that in face of it providing love's answer to faith's most tantalising and contradictory problems, we might well feel our minds struck dumb, our sensibilities deeply touched and our hearts themselves wholly subdued by love. The meaningful core of the Mass, like in this, that is par excellence, a drama which is ceaselessly enacted before us, tragedy everlastingly prolonged. The name by which this drama has been known since the 6th century is a term taken from the formulary with which aforetime it was brought to its closure. The formulary Ite Mis Est and it seems all too curt a word wherewith to clothe so ineffable a mystery. It seems indeed that other names for the Mass which were once in use are more suitable. Thanksgiving, liturgy, <coughs> the breaking of bread, synaxis or assembly, or to follow the usage of Tertullian, Justin, Martyr and Saint, Cyprian of Carthage, we might call it Dominica Passio, the Passion of the Lord. Herein lies the truth, for it is the Passion of Christ which inspires the Mass. That Passion besought, declared, manifested and fulfilled. Everything in the Mass converges on this fundamental fact of Christian faith that our redemption was wrought by the sacrifice of the cross and it is in relation to it rather than to a simple formulary of dismissal that the Mass is best understood. At first, the Mass preserved in precise terms the memory of that Last Supper, at which Jesus, but a short time before he suffered and died, blessed the bread and the wine, and made of them his body and his blood. And then said, Do this. For a commemoration of me. Luke 24. 
22, verse 19. His pregnant words, affecting by transubstantiation, the change of two very ordinary earthly substances into supernatural substances are the vehicles of a twofold message. By them was foretold the death of Christ in willing offering of himself, even before the enemies of Jesus became the ministrants at his oblation. So says Saint Paul. So it is the Lord's death that you are heralding whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup until he comes. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 26 And by the same token, inasmuch as he offered to his disciples the bread and the wine, which had been so marvellously changed, he made them sharers at another table as well as the Last Supper. That is to say, at the table of everlasting life. Therefore, the Mass is a remembrance of three truths. It is the reenactment of the words and gestures which marked the consecration that took place at the Last Supper. It is the lively memorial charged with its own dramatic meaning of the sacrifice offered on Calvary's hill. It is the banquet table to which all the baptised are called. Historically, the kernel of the Mass lies in its being a presentiment of the Last Supper through the repetition of those words and acts there taught us by Christ. Words and acts whose fathomless significance the faith of the first Christians knew how to apprehend. So, it is that there may be pictured those early masses which the apostles celebrated after Ascension Day or after the first Pentecost. They were quite simple and indeed they consisted of no more than the careful repetition of what the apostles had been taught. This note of an austere simplicity endured throughout the whole apostolic age. Do we not see St. Paul while on one of his missionary journeys officiating at the breaking of bread in a simple room on the third floor of a dwelling house while surrounded by a group which the little room could scarcely contain, Acts 20, verse 7, this sacred supper was not separated from the agape or love feast in which the primitive Christians gathered together, that they might bind themselves to the fellowship in the Lord. After the passing of almost 20 centuries, the Mass has lost the note of stark austerity. Other elements have been superimposed on the fundamental evangelical structure. The chief of these are a direct inheritance from the divine service 
of the older dispensation. Were not the apostles children of Moses? Were they not convinced that they were showing their fidelity to the precepts of his law when they gave adhesion to the revelation of Christ? As the Gospels and the book of the Acts testify divine service in the Jewish synagogues was made up of two parts. The prayer service comprised the singing or recitation of prayers from the scriptures, especially from one or another of those wonderful passages in the book of Psalms, wherein human fervency pours itself out in a fashion elsewhere unsurpassed. The didactic service consisted in listening to readers who took up the holy books of the law and the prophets. These characteristic notes were maintained in Christian services of worship. And even when Christians had entirely discontinued participation in the Jewish worship, they retained its chief features in their own. In this lies the root of the prayers at the beginning of Mass and of the readings from the Epistles and the Gospels. The Mass became set much as we now know it, insofar as concerns its broad structures at about the close of the third century. Although this or that part may show some growth or some diminution in importance from the usage of that time, the general plan of the ceremony is even now just such as it was then. However, in primitive times, the details of the Mass were not as rigorously fixed as they are in our day. And apart from an adherence to basic matters, there was a degree of permissible latitude which allowed the bishop or even the celebrating priest to express himself in extemporaneous prayer. Notable divergences in the manner of celebrating Mass long flourished as can easily be seen by taking up and comparing some of the old sacramentaries those missals so magnificently written and painted which were in use at solemn ceremonial, ceremonials during the whole period of the High Middle Ages. Even in our own time, one may find certain differences in right or use attached by privilege to particular dioceses, Lyon and Milan, are two examples or two religious orders as the Carthusians, Dominicans or Premonstratensians. Above all this distinction to be perceived in the sumptuous and prolix liturgies of the East when these are contrasted with relatively simple rites of the West in our day you're talking of 1958. It's changed a great deal since then. During the course of the centuries, certain new elements have been received into the Mass according to the living tradition of the Church. And just as the more elaborate music which succeeded the graver measures of the old 
plain chant clearly gives evidence of freedom from the restraints imposed on the more primitive constituents of the old liturgy, liturgy. All these newer elements possess in common two characteristics. They interrupt the course of the Eucharistic prayer and they often display great subjectivity and individualism. The Gloria, for example, was originally an acclamatory hymn proper to the Midnight Mass of Christmas. When it gave voice to the joy of Christian hearts in commemorating the Redeemer's birth. While the Credo, to cite another instance, is an individualistic proclamation of personal faith and belief, which found a place in the Mass at about the year 1000 being then most probably introduced to repel heretical doubt. Certain acts which would appear to be of manifest necessity in the Mass, such as the Great Elevation. Are likewise later additions to its primitive structure. In this instance, the solemn showing the host to the people serves as a reply to the separatist's contention that God is not present in the Eucharistic elements. Prove indeed the living heritage of a faith which ceaselessly restates itself. There is something attractively persuasive in the traditional adornments thus added to the framework of the Mass. They prove indeed the living heritage of a faith which ceaselessly restates itself. The Mass in its present rigidly regulated form, as we now know it in the West, was fixed on the morrow of the Council of Trent by Saint Pius V, by his bull Quo Primum of 1570. He expressed a wish to recall the Mass to its antique norms. He attempted at once to disencumber it of certain incidental elements and to impose the observance in uniform fashion throughout Christendom. The Mass was thus given definitive form by being closely associated with the primacy of the Apostolic See and the authority of St Peter's successor, while the Mass book endorsed by the Tridentine Fathers was none other than used in the Eternal City the Roman Missal. Therefore was it declared in the Catechism of the Council of Trent that no part of that Missal ought to be considered vain or superfluous, that not even the least of its phrases is to be thought wanting or insignificant. The shortest of its formularies, phrases, even which take no more than a few seconds to pronounce, 
form integral parts of a whole wherein are drawn together and set forth God's gift, Christ's sacrifice and the grace which is dowered upon us. This whole conception has in view a sort of spiritual symphony in which all themes are taken as being expressed, developed and unified under the guidance of one purpose. What then is the plan of the Mass? Its traditional division into the Mass of the ca ca Catechumens and the Mass of the Faithful is the result of historical circumstances. For the first part owes its existence to a provision for admitting to the common worship of Christians the unbaptized neophytes as well as the baptized. While the mass of the faithful is so called because after a certain point in the service had been reached, the unbaptized were in olden days dismissed. But it is the very manner of development assumed by the liturgy. It is the arc of its fulfilment which best marks out the moments or acts of the Mass in the very sense in which that term is used in respect of the drama. There five such acts. In the first of them, when I am on the threshold of this sacramental action, I pray, I beg that God will forgive what I have done amiss. I speak to him of my will to know him. I raise my voice in praise and in supplication. In the second, I hear the teaching of the church. First, as that teaching has been received from the apostles or was prophetically declared in the inspired books of the old law and later in the words of Jesus himself in the gospel. The substance of this teaching is summed up in the credo, which I then repeat by way of affirming my assent to it. Next, I find myself entering upon the sacrificial liturgy properly so considered. Christ himself offers himself in an oblation which is the sacramental core of the Mass. And it is my privilege to join in this grace-giving act. I therefore offer, through the ministration of the priestly celebrant, who is at once my witness and my representative, I offer those fruits of the earth which are to be changed, and this offering is in itself symbolic of that more personal and holy interior oblation, which I make myself. So that offering and the offerer become one. The fourth division is the most profound in meaning. It comprises the sacrificial act itself, by which and in which the victim is immolated 
It is I myself who by intimate participation in the sacrificial action of the priest. It is I myself who effect this immolation in which the victim of the sacrifice and its ministrant are one. Again, the divine body is nailed to the cross. Again, the redeeming blood gushes forth. And finally, in obedience to the will of Christ, I receive the Holy Communion and am nourished at the table of everlasting life. So it is that step by step, the liturgy of the Mass unfolds itself before our eyes in an impressive harmony which allows of no comparison in it and by it is every aspect of a man's religion duly accomplished. The Mass is the summation and complement of all man's hopes and good purposes. The Mass is the implementation of an interchange between God and myself. By it all that I would seek in my prayer is gradually brought to fulfilment almost before I have put my desire into words. Yet it may be asked if its effect is something which concerns nothing more than the relations existing between God and myself. It is true indeed that by the first of the new commandments we are enjoined to love God with our whole mind and heart. But it must not be overlooked that the second, which is as we have been taught, like unto the first, requires that man love his neighbour as himself. He has not understood the mass at all, who has failed to perceive that by it these two commandments are unceasingly recalled to our remembrance. The Mass first came into being as an act of common prayer. It was the prayer of the reunited Twelve. The prayer of those early Christian believers who were so bound in devotion one to another that they shared their goods in common. It was the prayer of the martyrs who mingled their blood in a common confession of the one Lord. It is no more than the simple truth to declare that at Mass we are all but little cells in one body, each of us a sheep that belongs to the one fold. The most outstandingly beautiful prayers of the liturgy, and they are among the most ancient as well, the collects the secrets and the post-communions are not grasped in their true significance unless they be considered as expressing the common prayer. They teach a lesson which is restated by the mementos, one of the living the other of the dead. 
which we find inserted in the prayer of the consecration itself, beyond all claims of time and space, beyond all compelling exactions of death itself, we make ourselves ready for union with God in just the degree that we are joined in fellowship one with another. And this is the whole sense and burden of the communion of saints. For the Mass is born of a twofold meaning and purpose. It is my own most urgent concern. Herein lie my life and my death. It is for me all unworthy as I am. It is for me that every Mass is celebrated for you. It is that there gushes forth this drop of my blood. Yet the fullest meaning of the Mass is unrealised unless it be shared in fellowship by me with all the children of God, unless they somehow join me in the path that leads to the light. For the soul, when lifted up, shall draw the world unto it, and each one of us is charged with the welfare of all. It is, of course, only the whole church, considered from its very beginnings, as extending and enduring until the end of time that is worthy and able to gather the elements and to set forth the oblation in this sacrifice to the infinite God. The Mass is our own concern. It concerns every one of us and it is as one individual, however insignificant, in the great multitude of human souls for whom Christ thirsted and whom he has redeemed his own blood. It is as one individual united to all my fellows by faith and in hope that I now will to assist at Mass, the while my heart is bowed in love and in expectation of the coming of the Lord. Amen. Thank you so much for listening. May God bless you and heal you. I'm sending you his peace in abundance. May you always be happy and joyful in the Lord. I hope you understood that. Um, it's very deep. The next time I record, it will be from page 31 in the book, as described by Henry Danrell Rops. And... Um, it's, I come, my Lord, in a ready spirit, armed with hope and with love. I look on this Mass as a happy oasis in my life, as a source of refreshment and of vigour, so that with a right heart I may resume my work, so that the burdens which oft times I find beyond bearing may be lightened through your loving kindness and your indulgent aid. How many are the hours I spend without a thought of you, my God, forgetful even of my own soul, but in the grip of alien forces. Keep me mindful of you and of what I am to you, for to think of one is to think of the other. I pray that these moments, which are made holy by being passed in your presence, may be a source of faith, of fervour and joy, 
Take away from me this bitterness which throttles me, this harsh and agonising dryness which holds me in its grip, this darksome discouragement which broods around me, cleanse me from my secret leanings to sin, from my inclinations impelling me to choose what is unworthy, from all the evil that I would not and that I yet do. At the very beginning of this Mass, make me ready to be what you would have me be. My trust in you is boundless, and my very first word is one of entire confidence in you. I believe in you. In you do I place my trust. It is you alone who are the rock of my being and the fulcrum of my strength. And it is because I am no more in your sight than a reed, a reed which rests in your hands, that I know myself to be strong. Therefore am I glad, glad in my Lord. There awaits me a renewal of my forces in which my soul shall come to full growth. By the glad light of this confrontation with you, for which I now make ready, my Lord. I beg you to lead me henceforth along the way in which I should go. Guide me by truth, which is the right hand of your love. Amen. That's a taste of the beginning of the next um, part three, because this was part two. God bless. And that's 56.40 seconds.